Women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but only 20% of its leadership. On her story, we'll explore the careers of bold and influential women from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill and learn how they've overcome the odds. I'm your host, Sandra Jane, and this is Her Story, a program where we explore what's beyond the glass ceiling. This special edition is guest hosted by Lynn Chow O'Keefe, founder and managing partner of Define Ventures and founding member of the Her Story Advisory Council. Well, Karen, thank you so much for joining us at Her Story, where we talk about leadership in healthcare. There is no better person to talk to than you about this in terms of your long accomplishments, in terms of being you know, a physician, being in government, um, and then also as a public health commissioner, and then also at Google. We have so much to cover here. What's been so phenomenal about Her Story is people really starting from the beginning. You know, many of us have been influenced by how we grew up, our family. You know, love to hear about how that's maybe shaped your vision of um, leadership and how you've kind of progressed in your career. I had a very scrappy um, uh, origin story. My, we were quite poor. I was a free, free lunch kid and um, my mom raised us there were three of us, I'm a middle child. She raised us after my dad left when I was five. Um, and she did that pretty well on her own. She didn't have family support for a variety of reasons. And it was just a remarkable woman. I mean, she, um, she didn't have a college degree. So she um, started working what she could do. She was a housekeeper basically. And one of the jobs she had for a while was um, people move out of apartments she would at night go in and clean them and our neighbor would spend the night at the house so that somebody was watching us and then she could go to work all night and then she was awake all day taking care of us. I mean, she was just, she's just a, the kind of person that put others before herself and um, found a way to help us get out of poverty by, you know, encouraging us to get an education. And uh, it shapes very much the way I think about the importance of doing for others um, and putting community first. You've done so much work around health equity, how you think about social determinants of health. Has this been a driver for you, having this type of perspective? It's interesting. I, I say a lot that my, my poverty was not, I was not a dangerous poverty. If we were poor and we had food insecurity, um, we had a, uh, my mom had mental health issues and so did my father. So there was a lot of instability in the household or in the, the circles around us, but I didn't have um, like threats to life and limb kind of sense. And I, I, I think I, I also had the um, advantage of growing up in Austin, Texas, which at the time was a relatively kind of small town, like 300,000 people, but it had a very strong um, infrastructure to support kids in poverty, basically. I mean, we had uh, uh, public transportation system that was reliable and safe that allowed me to get to after school programs and go to dance and theater classes at the uh, Austin Recreation Department Center that was basically after school we would go there because my mom was working and that was the way that we had further personal development had a safe place to be and it was basically free um, we had parks we had uh, outdoor theater um, movies in Zil Zilker Park uh, you know, just, just the, the reality that I had a um, programs like a recreation department or green space um, and safety makes me think a lot about how important context is to people's development. It wasn't just uh, that, that I had a mom who, you know, said education's your way out of poverty and think about others because someone's always struggling more than you are, no matter how much you are. Um, but also that it, it, it required, my, I guess the reason I'm grateful is because I had this, this social infrastructure basically. And I don't think a lot of kids have that. Uh, and, and when I was health commissioner, it was very stark contrast for me because I was, I was, when you're, when you're, um, the commissioner for an urban environment like New Orleans, you spend a lot of time in, in low income communities. And I, I think that's when that, that that contrast became really clear for me that because I had had all that, that the built environment support, there was more opportunity for me. And so one of the many ways that we have to drive equity for kids in communities is to see not only that they have strong education and, and parenting, 
but really that they also have those contextual factors factors in that, that social infrastructure that can provide support for them. Wow. Well, first of all, your mom sounds like an amazing, amazing woman and influence in your life. Did you have other influences or mentors as you went in? And how, how did this progress into healthcare and, and how you started your career there? For me, my, my peer group and my, my mentors came a lot through dance and theater that I did as a child. It was a really good, um, safe outlet for us. And that was a, um, an important counterweight to some of the other stressors. Um, and it, it drove some discipline, I think, into our lives that we might not have, have otherwise had it as kids. I had um, a couple of teachers in high school, Coach Patrick was one of them, who said something to me. Um, he told me that I was intellectually curious and no one had ever told me that before. And it just felt, you know, cool that somebody recognized an interesting talent that I had or a characteristic. And it, it inspired me to I think want to continue to learn and improve, make myself. I mean, he just happened to say the right thing at the right time. He was the social studies teacher. Um, and then somewhere in, in about that same time, uh, when I was uh, in the eighth grade, I was still dancing a lot, thinking I was going to go on that pathway, actually, professionally. And not that I could have, I'm, I'm not saying I was that good, but I thought in my head at the time, probably. Well, we're, we're um, lucky in healthcare then <laughs> that you didn't become a prima ballerina because <laughs> we need you in this space. And so I just, yeah. And so, so I thought, well, I don't, I, I did a little due diligence. I don't want to be a dancer because it sounds like a difficult life. What are the things that I like? I like helping people. I like science. Um, and then I did a book report um, and did it on on radiation therapy and, and got to go visit some some uh, uh, radiologists in their practice. And I thought, well, this seems like a nice marriage of all those things. I think I'll be a doctor. It was that naive. I, I didn't know any doctors. I didn't, you know, my, 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 my parents hadn't been to college. Uh, my, later, my mom did graduate from college. She went back to school, but it was, I just didn't have any idea what I was getting into. And, and I, I would say, Lynn, that's a little thematic of many, many things that I've jumped off the cliff in in my life. I'm like, this seems like the right thing to do. I'm just going to go and then sort of learn along the way. But, oh, I never looked back. I mean, I, I um, it was not easy for me to get into medicine. I'm, and statistically, I'm not the kind of kid that should have gotten in, especially uh, back in 88 when I started med school. I mean, poor kid, single parent, um, nobody in the family was a doctor. Uh, and I was able to for, um, get into Tulane who gave me a chance. And um, I, then I was able to get a scholarship from the National Health Service Corps to pay for school. Um, and it was, uh, otherwise I would have been in you know, crazy debt, but it was uh, all, as everything worked along the pathway, it was the right school for me to be at. It was the right city here in New Orleans. And HRSA, that program that, that sort of drove me towards primary care were sort of all the right mix of things to build out a, a career that I've just loved. So how, I mean, amazing, because you knocked it out of the park, getting your MD, your, your uh, MPH, you, you went to Harvard too, right? So there's like so many things you did is, how did you then become, if you will, commissioner of health for the city of New Orleans versus practicing medicine? Was that also a um, accidental or was it intentional in terms of how you, you thought about your next step? Backing up before I became health commissioner, I joined the faculty at Tulane when I finished my residency. I'm an, I'm an internist and I had um, in my head that I wanted to do hospital quality work. And so I was, um, I was doing that for free. I told the chair of medicine that I'll do all this other work, but I'll also want to do this work. So he said, fine, but I'm not paying you to do it because he didn't even whatever understand what it was I was trying to accomplish. And I did that work. However, about a few months in, he said to me, Karen, starting uh, July 1st next year, you're going to be the, the director of the resident internal medicine clinic. This is where the trainees you know, teach or see patients and, and we teach. And I said, thank you so much for the opportunity, but I'm not interested in running an outpatient clinic. I like hospital work. And he, he said, I don't think you understand. Starting July 1st, you're going to be running the resident clinic. And, and, and I, I just, I said, oh, I see, what, I see what's going on here. And it was such a gift. I, I didn't want to do it. I hated clinic. I thought it was um, a broken environment where you never had the records of the patients. This is back in the paper days. Uh, you didn't have continuity. Um, it was difficult to teach in that environment. Um, and I liked the, the pace of inpatient medicine, et cetera, et cetera. 
so what he gave me as a gift was many things. One is a leadership role where um, I had essentially free reign to to redesign a system uh, for this is at charity hospital or public hospital because there was no one else paying attention to it and so we got to implement electronic scheduling um, and we began looking at electronic health records um, even way back in this is uh, about 1999 and we did just a lot of quality improvement work essentially so to make it so that when people arrived at clinic instead of it being 15% of the time that they had a record there that it was 90% of the time. And we were able to improve continuity and change the wait times and get, get, get down from 12 months of an appointment to the next available appointment to two weeks and hold it there. And I just got so excited about the fact that you could take a broken system, do a root cause, work with teams and make it a better system for the patients, but also for the people who were there in, in the learning environment and in the care environment. And that spurred in me an interest to do more than, than um, take care of patients in front of me, which I did do for 20 years. I love the practice of medicine, but, but that's, but, but if you really want to level the playing field, um, to really raise, you know, raise the, raise the, the floor and, and eliminate the need, you've got to have a better system is the point. And I got really excited about the system this, and not only in that environment, but as the, as time went on, include, uh, going back to this idea of context and the, the, the systems in which we live, learn, work and play. And that's public health and I uh, wanted to expand what I was able to do to help my patients and my community beyond what happened in the healthcare environment, but into their everyday life. So let's flash forward to uh, when you were there um, and, uh, you know, love to hear about one of the things that happened, I would believe at this time was Hurricane Katrina and what it meant to be in that role as a leader during that crisis. Um, would love to hear a bit about that. Did that shape how you think about things? And then we'll we'll fast forward and we'll get there with uh, COVID, obviously. But love to hear about that early experience in public health crises. When Katrina happened in August of 2005, I, I actually, Lynn, was still in the faculty at Tulane and was the uh, I had a line job. I was the chief of general medicine, <clears throat> but about uh, three quarters of my time was was research oriented. And I was on a pathway of, um, I say sometimes trying to change the world one paper at a time, because I was doing this very academic thing. And um, some people like Francis Collins, who run the NIH, they can change the world one paper at a time, or Tony Fauci, that was definitely not gonna be my path. And so I think the, the occurrence of that catastrophe um, was a moment in time when I had to reflect on where I could make the most difference is the point. And because of my, um, experiences with knowledge about um, relationships with passion for the health of my community. Um, I decided to put down my um, more academic pursuits and step into the community. And uh, it was, well, it's a, it's a, a long story. And uh, I think that the, the long and short of it is that from, um, uh, from the time after the storm uh, passed until the time I went to Washington, so some period of about um, 10 years, worked on, I guess it's less than 10 years, from 2005 until 2014, however long that is. Is that 10 years? So um, I worked on rebuilding community health and, and public health in, in New Orleans. And the reason I, I tell you I wasn't health commissioner in particular is so that you can understand that um, for me, that experience was about influential leadership and not line authority. We didn't, we, we had a vacuum. We had no public health leadership, essentially locally, and the community was, was struggling and flailing and trying to figure out what to do. So one of the, the roles that I had was to convene and to, to bring people to the table who came from community health, mental health, social care sector, academia, um, and who didn't have a discreet role or responsibility, but who cared deeply about rebuilding a better New Orleans. And um, you will find that story um, in, in parallel. We, we did this in health, but it was a similar story in the educational system and the criminal justice system and the, even the levies that, that citizens stepped forward and said, this is broken and it needs to be fixed. And the leadership we have right now is incapable of doing that. And so we're gonna find a way to, to not only stand up the new structure, but stand up a new 
governmental infrastructure that can better support the community going forward. And that, Lynn, um, is, is one of the reasons that I became health commissioners because I had done all this work through my you know, academic chair and we built out community health and really made a lot of progress. But I didn't wanna leave a city without a strong public health department, without real statutory public health leadership that every day woke up and said, today, you know, again, is my, my responsibility is, is the health of everyone who lives, learns, works and plays in my community. And um, how, how can we uh, bring forward that kind of vision of a truly healthier New Orleans? Because it's not only gonna happen from healthcare is the point. I knew we needed to have a stronger public health uh, enter enterprise. So that's the, 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 that sort of um, high level, happier story about how we got to improving health and public health the community. I'll tell you, we built a network of community health centers that serve about a quarter of a million people, which is about a, a quarter of the city of New Orleans. Um, at the time, most all of them were uninsured. Now they're insured through the um, Affordable Care Act or Medicaid and are, are receiving care in inpatient center medical homes that are very high quality across the city. And they're enabled with, with health IT. We're all very proud of the work we did. It's an accredited public health department. But it was not, um, none of that was, was seamless or easy. And it required, uh, frankly, just a, a lot of like me getting up day after day after day saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let this defeat me. <laughs> like it's the right thing to do for our community and, and just being tenacious about, about wanting it to, wanting, wanting, wanting to overcome that big crisis, but then realizing that every day there were all these little crises that everybody in my community was facing every day and we needed to find a way to smooth that out for them too. One thing and just in that experience, which would be great to hear because there are so many individuals listening to this is, you know, it that sounds like a tumultuous time. And also, you know, you had to you had to be influential at times and then you it sounds like you had more line authority, but you still had to gather different opinions and probably different leadership. I've got to presume when you talk about community health, how did you as a leader kind of galvanize people to a vision and then to action? Were there certain things that you learned that we could each take as leaders to understand that? Because that's particularly, I think, you know, a difficult situation that every leader leader sees and love to hear if there were ways or strategies or methods that you thought about. I think that they're just generally good advice for being a good human. <laughs> um, one, one is um, to listen, but I think more importantly, to listen with humility. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, I actually started to learn that from my patients even before the crisis. But, but over the course of, of all of these years, even into today, I, I find that um, if, I can, if I can listen with humility and be honest about that, be honest about my own, where, where my knowledge begins and ends, that people are then even more forthcoming. It's a, it's a trust building exercise, I guess, maybe at the, at the root and in medicine, trust is like job one, right? I mean, if, I, if you don't trust me as your doctor, we're not gonna get very far together in, in your health and your health outcomes. And so a lot of my patients really help me understand about, about listening. And, but also there's this, there's this thing about listening, Lynn, which is um, I, I've had to continue to learn um, to hear. I don't, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of how to say this to you. I like, I, I, you know, if you have, uh, have have uh, I've had so many patients where they were trying to tell me that they're taking their medication, but their blood pressure is still high and it's not really working for them. I have this one woman in particular I could tell you about that. Um, and, and over the course of time, as I continued to build a relationship with her and really listen, I, I learned that she was in a, a, uh, an abusive relationship and it, she was compliant. She was just so un, under so much adrenal, adrenaline stress all the time um, from this um, physical, uh, physically abusive relationship. She, that's the help she needed. She didn't mean to be, need to keep hammering on her about taking her meds. When we got her that help, she was able to get off her hypertensives actually. Her, her story, and there's so many others where it was looking past the first layer is what I'm trying to say. And that is a, that that listening, and then listening and knowing that you don't know the answers. Um, so not going into it with the solution, but listening really what is their problem. I think is the first part. The second is, um, I think just being able to find common ground. This is one of the things I love to do in work, and in a time of crisis, when you're trying to bring people to a shared vision to get over the hump, um, when you're trying to get people just 
to de develop shared policy uh, work that I've done at the national level um, or just to solve a thorny problem um, in, in maybe that feels more mundane. There's always common ground. The Venn diagrams always overlap, right? <laughs> um, and and uh, it's, it, to me, that's, it's just such a, such a sweet spot when you find that moment and you're like, oh, what you're saying is this and what you're saying is this. And I think what we're, it, does this make sense that this is the thing that we can all do together? Yes, okay, well then let's move forward on that. And yeah, I, 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 I think it comes, it, it, it maybe, maybe one of the reasons I like doing it is because it feels so, so joyful when you find that place of common ground, even for people who think they have nothing in common. We need so much of that right now, absolutely. And so powerful and, and it really, I'd love to then delve into because you, you know, again, the patient human relationship you just said with, with physician, and then you did it on community level, and then you went on a national level at HHS. Did that, and it sounds like a lot of those principles held true, but did they further in some way or, or um, did you kind of learn new lessons from that? It was so hard to do federally. And there are, there are a bunch of reasons. One is it's really easy when you're working in a, as a principal, a federal, uh, in the federal hierarchy, you know, there's these appointed positions and you're a principal. So then you have a ring of people around you that are dictating your schedule and telling you where to go. And it would be very easy to just live in that bubble and have people telling you what you want to hear and, and you only see things that they want you to see. And, um, I, uh, I had a, um, a moment actually when I came home, came back to New Orleans uh, for a weekend and I was driving around with my friend who was the then, who had become health commissioner after I left. And we were uh, going to an, an event in a community, a really low income community here. And she, and, and I, I looked at her and I said, I haven't seen poverty in months. This is not good. <laughs> like my job is to, is to make policy for all people in America and not just the people that can make it into my office. And that caused me to shift a few things, but definitely um, as I did trips in the field to do listening sessions and um, to, um, to get my, to break my team of, of setting up a listening session with people who would say, we love your policy. We think, you know, your HIT approach is great, right? Yeah. We love electronic health records. It's like, that's not what I need to hear. I need to hear this is broken. You're an idiot. Like these are the things that you should do differently because you have to be real about it. Right. I mean, you have to get real input and feedback, but you, I think I just, I had to, what I'm saying is I had to work to make sure I stayed in touch with a counterweight, counter opinions, counter points of view, and just frankly reality um, and, and find sort of new ways, new ways to do it. And, and the, the, we'll get, we'll get to Google, but I had started to do that when I joined Google um, with listening sessions and then the pandemic happened. And so it's been harder for me to feel like I can stay grounded in who I'm here to serve, um, which is which is really what drives me. It's really beautiful because I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if the one thing that's given you, if I hear you edge in your career is just this perspective that started from childhood and the listening and the understanding and then, you know, through again, your relationship as a physician and then to the community and then on a national level. And now you're doing that. It sounds like at Google too, like that's one thread, if you will, are there other edges or things that, um, you feel like in, in your career that have kind of taken you to that next level of understanding or leadership? I'm, I'm a little unsure how to answer the question because, um, I feel so grateful, honestly, for the opportunities that I've had. And I know we're not supposed to say that. I know we're supposed to say I was, um, I've worked hard and I've prepared myself and, and I, you know, I, I, all these opportunities are here because I made them and created them, but I clearly didn't create a hurricane. But what I did do was say, this is a mess and I have skills and I can make a difference. And uh, so I, I, I tend to run into the fire is what I say sometimes. Like I, uh, when, when there's a when 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 there is a a problem, a disaster, a broken health department, a broken community. Uh, not that I'm not saying Google's broken at all. I think it's a different issue. Google's got an opportunity, but um, I don't shy away from those kinds of challenges. I, I'm actually really inspired by them. I love things that are a mess and finding order to them, and then um, seeing that that they that they are a new, better iteration. And so I don't know if that's edge. But it's her, it, it definitely uh, drives me. And so sometimes what I'm saying is 
things have come to me and some people might have run away <laughs> because because they look too messy and scary. And uh, that those are exactly the kinds of thorny things that I, I like to, to, to tackle with really smart people and, and think about what could be, how do you, how do you, how do you make something better out of something that's not, not so good right now? Well, and it energizes you, you can hear it in kind of how you're thinking. And it probably dovetails to what your, your social studies teacher said to you is you're intellectually curious and you put those things together and you listen. One of my other skills, this is a skill of mine, is that I, I'm a good bridger. Um, uh, so I, I see ways that, that pieces fit together that I think maybe sometimes other people don't see. And I don't know why I can see those things, but I also see the way that, like I love bridging medicine and public health and technology or um, if our, uh, you know, that's why I love social determinants of health and public health, because it's all about bridging these worlds and they're different languages and cultures and, you know, approaches to, to, to problem solving. And so I, I love applying that um, in, in the different worlds where I've been. It's like bringing the, the best of the best together. It, it's part of that finding common ground thing too, I guess. Well, let's definitely talk about that, how you've bridged into the technology world. I'll never forget you and I were on a phone call and, you know, I was talking about what was happening in the Valley and you were talking about, you know, in healthcare and you, you just stopped at some point in the conversation and said, Lynn, I just like the way you talk. And, and I, and I know what you mean, you know, we, we use these terms in Silicon Valley and I could, I could hear the wheels turning a on the intellectual curiosity and then the bridging that you're talking about. And sure enough, I think it had probably been a couple months after that conversation or a little bit more, but you joined Google. Um, talk about that decision. I could see it with the intellectual curiosity, the bridging. Um, and then, you know, what has it been like to be part of now this tech leader, which is so different than all the other experiences you've had? It's diff definitely different than any other experience. So there are parts of it that are similar. So that, that, that there, I, I find, you know, oh, that looks familiar. I, I sort of understand that, that process. Um, well, you know, just to kind of go back to the origin stories and, and sort of thinking about other little girls growing up in poverty and what are the things that they need to have the kind of opportunities that I've had essentially and little boys too. I think, um, Part of my journey throughout my career has been okay well i'm good at health i'm good at medicine i'm going to do that okay well but i also want to scale to your point um and i need a bigger platform so then so there are more and more ways that i can continue to make a difference and as i learned about the, the power of data to tell stories and to um drive continuity of care continuity of relationship to impact public health decision making that that got me more and more involved in sort of understanding not only the application of data but the sourcing of it and the the respect for it and um, how we um, work with consumers and communities to to do the right thing with their with their data. This is part of my office of national coordinator role and as the national coordinators, how do we think about consumer access to data, drive policy that gives them that access in a way that is meaningful to them, and then what are the use cases? How do we how do we put it to good use? There's more to this, more to the the story than just the data and the people. Um, it's also about policy, and um, revenue, and spending, and rules, and sort of all these other um, accoutrements. And I've had experience in a number of those areas. But I think the one thing that I never have um, had the chance to really understand is how do we give agency or ignite the agency in consumers. When you're doing public health, you know, you're, you're pushing, you're trying to get people to feel empowered or want to take care of their health or, you know, engage in, in your Let's Move program. And it's a, it's a struggle because it's, it's, it's hard to know what's on their minds and how to meet them where they are when, when you're not as knowledgeable about it. So fast forward to a company like Google, where every second of every day, people all around the world meet us where we are. They're like, hey, I have this question. Hey, I'm interested in this. And just the, 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 the shift of focus then for me is, is if I understand the healthcare side and even the public health side, it's a big really other impo important part of the equation is how can we really empower consumers 
give them the power. I don't, I'm, I'm not using all necessarily the right words because I really do genuinely believe they have power. We just don't know how to harness it and they don't know how to harness it. And so that's, that was a huge driver for me and being excited to join the company, just knowing that this is an opportunity to really, truly work with community and see if we can, we can figure out how to create a healthier planet. It completely makes sense. I mean, you are one of these rare people, I think, who have now seen all these experiences. And let's walk in. You started at Google, I think, in late Q4, 2019. December 2nd. Yeah. That's right. Of 2019. And then we flash forward into the first quarter of 2020, COVID hits. And just all of your experience, I've just got to believe there are not many people at Google who are that, you know, right place experience for this type of crisis. What has it been like to address COVID in this world on a Google platform? Well, I, um, you know, caveated by saying would, would be delighted if we'd never had the pandemic. Um, uh, on the other hand, I'm, I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else. The, the, um, you said it well, I mean, I have this, um, experience with crisis management. I know public health. I know science. I know medicine. I understand policy. Um, I, I didn't know Google that well at the time, but, um, I was able to marry up with people who did. I got pulled into the company's central response um, early on in the crisis. So I was able to apply my talents, not only from what I learned during Katrina, but as health commissioner, you deal with crises all the time. And then when I was in Washington, we had Ebola and Zika and Flint and crises there as well. So I was able to, to, to provide the clinical leadership for the company response, um, as well as product stewardship around how we message to the world um, about what COVID is and how they can protect themselves and their communities. We have search and maps and YouTube and ads and play and all kinds of other platforms where we can amplify the messages from public health authorities. And that's essentially um, the, the most of what we've done though, quite a bit also is um, providing data for evidence-based decision-making for public health and for medicine um, and partnering with public health through our exposure notifications work that we've done. And I'll, I'll give you like one statistic that um, uh, is that we created, for example, some public health messaging around COVID to direct people to public health authorities on YouTube. And within the first six months, we'd had more than 400 billion impressions of people looking at health information that we put forward. You can never get that kind of reach, no matter which government you work for. And and the fact that we're giving people good information, like it just feels really, it, it, I'm just um, glad that we can be here and partner with public health in this time. So um, it's been a whirlwind year though. <laughs> we could talk more about what else I've learned, but, but um, I, I, was, I was glad I was here in this, in this moment in history because I think we're doing a lot of good. Well, I, I'm glad you're, you're there too. I mean, I, I, I take what you just said and in a way you've scaled from the one-to-one -one relationship and I should check the, city of New Orleans, like how big that is. And then we have 330 million people in the US when you were in HHS. And, and now you've gone to, you know, four to five billion, right, in the world and being able to touch that. And it's just, I'm so glad it's that you're- a dream for public health and arts like me, I have to tell you. <laughs> you know, if you really- you health, wanna... <laughs> Quite frankly, now is what you're tackling, Karen, truly, is what you're tackling. I. You know, I want to just wrap up just kind of reflective, you know, you talked about, um, you know, little girls and, and little boys, but if you were to give one piece of advice to your younger self, what, what would that be? I have two pieces of advice. <laughs> um, one is about pacing. And I, I, this is a, a common question I get from people earlier in their careers. They want to do all these things and do them so quickly. But I, I, um, and it's not that you shouldn't help be helpful when you can be, but I, I do think uh, in retrospect, there's some things I could have paced a little bit better so that you have some of that balance. Um, though, I mean, honestly, Lynn, I probably wouldn't have changed a, <laughs> changed a thing about what I did. But we do have a family motto, um, which is um, Ill illegitimate non proverendum. And um, it's don't let the don't let people get you down. I'll, I'll clean it up a little bit. Um, it's, it's not, uh, and my husband and I, you think about that a lot. It came up, especially 
after Katrina, things were very difficult. Um, I was sometimes at odds with people in power, but, but we were always trying to just do the right thing for community first. And I had some terrific support from our university president, for example, Scott Cowan, but you know, sometimes people weren't so nice. And, and Jay would often tell me that he'd say, oh, it did me non carburum Don't worry about that. Just do the right thing. Just keep doing the right thing. So I would, I would have told myself that before 2005 when that started to be um, our family motto. That's amazing. And maybe that's the title of your book. If you were to have a book, uh, maybe we have that title there. Well, Karen, thank you so much. I mean, honestly, when I say this, you are the right person at the right time, at the right place to make this world a better place. I truly mean that your story is just so powerful. And thank you so much for taking this time with us and sharing, you know, from the earlier years to everything in between to, you know, influencing World Health Now, which is the platform you have. We really appreciate it. Lynn, thank you so much for the time. It's uh, always a delight to get to talk to you and I'm happy that I got to share a little bit of my story. Thank you so much. <laughs>